Well, hello again. In this example, you will learn how to handle loads which are not applied at the joints. Specifically, you will see how superposition is used to deal with this particular situation. We're looking at a two-member beam here. We are being told that we're already given the global and element stiffness matrices. What we're being asked to do is use the matrix approach to solve for the joint displacements, reactions, and member end forces for the particular load that is being applied. First thing I'm going to do is label my unrestrained degrees of freedom, 1 and 2, and then label the restrained degrees of freedom, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The element stiffness matrices as they are given to me, use these as the origins for each of the members. And then the last thing we want to do is highlight that these matrices are developed in units of kips and inches, and so I'm just going to tell you that that distributed load, given 2.6 kips per foot, is equivalent to 0.2167 kips per inch. And each of these members is 144 inches. Here is the global and element stiffness matrix for member number one. And it has degrees of freedom 3, 4, 1, and 2. Then we also have this local and global stiffness matrix for member number two, and it's associated with degrees of freedom one, two, five, and six. These combine together to give the overall structure matrix, and we can then partition that structural matrix according to the unrestrained and the restrained degrees of freedom. Thus, this submatrix can be labeled as KUU. This submatrix can be labeled as K. R, U. And those will be the ones that we use for the later matrix math. Indeed, here they are. Let's go ahead and label those degrees of freedom once again, just so that we don't lose sight of that. Now, the matrix formulation says that I need to assemble this F sub U vector, which are the forces that are being applied to the unrestrained degrees of freedom in the original structure. If you take a look at those degrees of freedom, there are currently no forces so I would put in values of 0 and 0. However, we do have that distributed load that we need to come up with, and the way we handle that is we come up with a set of statically equivalent forces that occur at all of the degrees of freedom. And so this is what we would call the F sub FEF vector. FEF standing for fixed end forces. Since member 2 is the only one that has fixed end forces on it, we will take a look directly at that. And essentially the process is that we lock all of the degrees of freedom and we identify what the resulting reactions are that occur there. So for member two, we have degree of freedom one, degree of freedom two, five, and six. Looking at a beam chart, we can identify what the fixed end moments and fixed end shears are for this. Let's remember that our distributed load here is zero point 2167 kips per inch. So we can go ahead and calculate those quantities. So WL squared over 12, that is 374.4 kip inches. And then WL over 2, and that will equal 15.6 kips. So we can generate the fixed end force vector for member 2, remembering that the degrees of freedom are 1, 2, 5, and 6, and I then just need to put those known quantities in their appropriate place. So here's 15.6 kips, 374.4 kip inches, 15.6 kips, negative 374.4 kip inches. So that's what I have coming from member 2. What I need to do is drop that back into a global vector that would account for all six degrees of freedom. And so that's what I'll do next. 15.6 kips associated with degree of freedom one, 374.4 kip inches associated with degree of freedom two. If you look back at the original structure, degree of freedom three and degree of freedom four would have no fixed end forces that develop due to that distributed load. So I can drop in values of 0.0, .0 and units on those will be kips and kip inches respectively. 
and then for degree of freedom 5 and degree of freedom 6 I get the following quantities 15.6 and negative 374.4 kip inches. Then the last thing I need to do with this vector before I use it is I do need to partition it into the unrestrained degrees of freedom and the restrained degrees of freedom. And I will just label this as fu dash fef. So that's the fixed end forces that are associated with the unrestrained degrees of freedom. I can then carry out the matrix operations by taking the inverse of the KUU matrix and multiplying it by this force vector which is found by taking the F sub U vector and subtracting off the F sub U FEF vector. So that's what we see going on right here and that will result in the following quantities negative 0.7179 inches and 0, 0.000 ratings. The next step would be to calculate the reactions by taking the usual calculation of KRU times delta U, but then we need to make a correction to those reactions based upon the fixed end forces that we had there. And so as a reminder, we do have these fixed end forces that we computed before for a degree of freedom 3, 4, 5, and 6, having those respective values of 0, 0, 15.6, and negative 374.4. We perform those matrix operations and get the following reactions for degrees of freedom 3, 4, 5, and 6. That will give me 5.2 kips, 374.4 kip inches, 26.0 kips, and negative 1123.2 kip inches. With the nodal displacements and the reactions calculated, we are prepared to compute the member end forces. The basic matrix operation for calculating member end forces will be as such, where we take the element stiffness matrix, multiply by the nodal displacements for that element, and that will give us Q, the member end forces in the local coordinate system. So in this particular case, we are looking at member number one, so degree of freedom three, four, one, and two, having the respective displacements of zero, zero, negative 0 0.7179, and zero. That will result in member end forces of 5.2 kips, 374.4 kip inches, negative 5.2 kips, and a positive 374.4 kip inches. I can do the same thing for member number 2, going ahead and labeling those degrees of freedom 1, 2, 5, and 6, and getting those displacements sketched in, negative 0 0.7179 inches, and then you have 0 radians, of degree of freedom 2, zero inches and zero radians of degrees of freedom five and six respectively. But the one difference between member two and member one is that member two requires us to superimpose back what the fixed end forces were that were created due to that distributed load. And as you will recall we had values of 15.6 kips, 374.4 kip inches, 15.6 kips, and negative 374.4 kip inches. And those matrix operations will produce the following values, 5.2 kips, negative 374.4 kip inches, 26.0 kips, and negative 1123.2 kip inches. Of course, the member end forces could then be converted into beam sign convention. We won't do that in this example. But that is the process that we follow. That concludes this example. As always, it's a beautiful day for studying structures.